Passing down the cottage to your children can be a wonderful thing, but keep in mind that sometimes children have disagreements. In the case of the cottage, those disagreements may have to do with how to use the property or even the costs of upkeeping it. To help ensure the good times do continue, you may want to consider setting up a cottage agreement. Nicole Ewing, Director of Tax and Estate Planning at TD Wealth, joins me now on what to know. Um, I think those were gentle things I was saying about what disagreements can be about. I know they can be much worse, but let's start with the basic what is a cottage agreement? Well, it, it's essentially a binding contract between the owners and potentially the users of the property, which outlines everybody's obligations to each other with respect to usage and upkeep and financial obligations. But it's really sort of creating a structure for everyone to be on the same page about what the rules are going to be, what the expectations are, and ultimately to set a framework for if there are disagreements, how are they going to be resolved and make sure that there is that mechanism in place. Now, there's a few different ways of setting up a cottage agreement. So potentially the parents may leave the cottage in the will to multiple beneficiaries and require them to enter into a co-ownership agreement in order to um, become the beneficiaries of that property. They may sell or gift the property during their lifetime and may be helping the children enter into that agreement themselves, whether they're a party to that agreement or not. Or they might be transferring it into a family trust and having either the trust agreement or a standalone other document outlining what the rules and obligations are, ensuring that the parents, if they're going to want to continue to have control and access to that property, that that's outlined in the agreement, but ultimately all of the future owners, the children are going to be bound to this agreement between them about how they're going to use and own this property. All right, so great context and like, you know, the, the principle behind it, the ways you make it happen. And in some cases, I think it is a make them happen that way. Uh, but then the next thing is what actually should go in the agreement. What are the kinds of things that you should be thinking yeah. about? So we want to think here about budget. How are the finances going to be covered? Are there going to be different rules for mandatory um, expenses versus some that are nice to haves? Um, you know, do we, you share the expenses equally or will it be dependent on who's using the property more or I'd say less advisable as to who can afford <laughs> more of it. Um, it should also outline sort of the, the, the time and usage considerations. Is this going to be a free for all where anyone can come anytime? Are there going to be blocks of time that certain folks can come and others are not allowed to come? And then if it's your block of time, are you allowed to send a friend in your place? Are you allowed to rent it out to a stranger? Um, what happens to this property on your death? Are you able to will your interest on to your spouse? Or is it going to be restricted to passing it on to your children or other members of the family? Um, you might want to include things like um, who's responsible for the administration of certain things, so paying the property tax, um, the utility bills, arranging for the opening and closing of that property. So you can really get into the nitty gritty, but really the most important part is to include, you know, how are decisions going to be made? Are they going to be made on a majority basis? Or does it need to be unanimous? Does anybody have veto rights? Does it depend on the type of decision that's being made? Are there certain no goes and other maybe a little bit of discretion can be allowed um, and then ultimately that dispute resolution clause in there that who is going to if there is a breakdown in the relationship and, and they simply can't reach a resolution are we going to mediation are we going to arbitration are we going to the courts and making sure that that dispute resolution mechanism actually makes sense that it's not something that's so expensive and so convoluted that it actually puts everybody in a really negative position. This is supposed to help with the decision-making process and potentially prevent the need for the dispute resolution clause to kick in by having the rules outlined in advance, but also providing for those solutions that, you know, if and when things kind of go um, unexpectedly, that there's a way of resolving that and maintaining family harmony. Nicole, we've got about, about a minute. I, I want to squeeze one more thing in, too. Uh, I think this just tells people there's lots to think about and they should talk to somebody. But what are some of the potential headaches that an agreement prevents? And I find cautionary tales do the best job to tell people why things need to be in place. They, they really do. We, we have situations where there's no agreement in place and a spouse or other person has been contributing either financially or by their labor to the property. And they may make a claim for a trust relationship or resulting or constructive trust. We could end up having 
uh, creditors of individuals come after them, either family law creditors or if there's a bankruptcy. Um, so outlining in advance what's supposed to happen in those situations. Um, if somebody lives more closely to the cottage than everybody else and sort of takes over and becomes the person who's deciding what happens there, um, should they be paying a little bit more? because they're using it more often. We often have siblings who are in different provinces and some just frankly aren't going to be able to use the property in the same way. What are their obligations? And do they still need to be paying the same amount for the new roof as the family that's there every week? And you know, others they say that the one about renting it out as an Airbnb or, or other um, sort of it, renting it out to strangers to come in and use that property without the permission of the rest of the family, how do you prevent that if there's not that agreement in place? So there's a lot of things that can go wrong and we want to anticipate those ahead of time and sort of build around those rules about what the expectations are. Nicole, I've only got about 10 seconds. You talked a bit about recourse uh, if there is a disagreement, but let's just go straight to if you're listening to this and thinking, I need to do this, who should you talk to? Speak to your legal advisor, go to a lawyer who's familiar with these issues, somebody who has dealt with these before, and also engage your, your banker and others you know, who can help you advise about maybe cash flow issues, setting up mandatory reserves so that there's the money in place to be able to do some of those necessary and hopefully um, fun sort of expenses at the cottage. <music>